the actual content. For those of you who were elsewhere earlier today, and this is your introduction to uh, me, I'm Justin Hester. I'm the uh, Astros Technical Trainer at Digium. Uh, here's some information about me. Uh, so take a picture. Uh, I'm just kidding. If you really want my contact information, I'll be glad to share it with you um, and just come and ask. Right now, we're going to look at configuring endpoints and a little bit of interactive dial plan. Uh, again, this being session three of Asterisk from Scratch, uh, geared towards administrators that have maybe messed with Asterisk or used uh, some tool that uses Asterisk as a component, but you're not so keen on the command line or use it a little bit, but you want to kind of get, get some information about that low, lower level stuff, but at a higher level, if that makes any sense. So, endpoints. Can't, uh, <laughs> can't live with them, can't live without them, right? So, we've broken this down into a three-step program, okay? Three-step program, and you too can have an endpoint configured uh, with asterisk. First, you have to configure an account on asterisk, and basically what that means is add something into the config file inside of asterisk, telling asterisk about the endpoint, right? So, asterisk has to know about the endpoint. You have to go into your dial plan and create an extension that will actually ring the endpoint. Otherwise, it's not going to be very useful. You can register a SIP phone to asterisk, right? That's, that's why it feels kind of funny when you, when you first learn about SIP registration as opposed to call completion. SIP registration is, just, is only the mechanism that allows asterisk to know where the phone is on the network. That's it. Until you go and configure an extension, that endpoint is not going to ring when you dial some number. You have to go into extensions.conf and set up an extension that will actually execute the dial application and ring the endpoint. Step three, configure the endpoint itself to match. So we've given asterisk some information about the device. Now let's go to the device and give it some information about asterisk. Everybody with me? Okay. So <clears throat> zooming in a little bit on step one there, the bare minimum of information the server needs to know needs to know about the transport, and generically speaking, that's just uh, what IP address and port the asterisk server is going to listen for SIP traffic, okay, for SIP messages. Okay, that's, that's what we're defining when we talk about the, the transport. The location of the phone, this is IP address of the phone, okay? Uh, the credentials for the phone to register, it's going to need a username and password. This is just basic security information. You don't want anybody to just walk up and uh, you know, get on your network and send a SIP message and say, yeah, let's set up a call. Uh, you want them to authenticate first. So we need some credentials for the account. And then we need to tell Asterisk how to route it. This is uh, a little bit of the, a little bit more of the extensions.conf, right? How to route calls from this endpoint once they hit Asterisk. So endpoint dials an extension. That call goes into Asterisk. Now what is Asterisk going to do with it? That's what, that's what we're talking about here, routing the call. So we have a little bit of a sub bullet here. By using asterisk dial plan, you must tell the server where the phone will begin to look in the dial plan logic. What a sentence. Uh, earlier today, for those of you that were here, or those of you that are in the know but were not here, uh, we talked about contexts, dial plan context, right? So those are buckets in the dial plan. Um, when you configure an endpoint, you will define which context that endpoint is allowed to dial into. That's all we're talking about here. Uh, by using the dial plan, you must tell the server where the phone will begin. When that endpoint dials into asterisk, it has a context that it's allowed to, to access. And within that context, hopefully, will be an extension that you've dialed. Otherwise, the call will fail, because asterisk doesn't have anything to do with it. It doesn't know what to do with that call. All of these things, uh, conceptually, are the same whether you're using ChanSIP or PJSIP. All right? Conceptually, now the configuration looks different. We're going to look at examples of both, okay? Um, but conceptually, the, the, the same rules apply. So sip.conf or pjsip.conf, and then of course extensions.conf for the extension itself. Here's sip.conf. Now, does this look familiar to anybody? Let me see, I got three whole hands and a few yeses. Okay, all right. Yay, you're awake, you're alive, thank you. Uh, so this looks familiar, and this, this is safe, right? This is home. You like this. You don't want to see, you don't want to hear about this PJ SIP stuff. That's crazy talk. What are we doing? It's, it works. Why are we changing it? It works. Um, yeah, 
It, and it does work, right? It, don't, don't get me wrong, Chansip is not just a, a, a gosh awful tar pit or anything. It's, it, it works. It's been working very well for a while and will likely continue to work very well for a while. Um, so nsip.com, for those of you that are, do not know what, what's going on here, this is yet another configuration file in the Etsy asterisk directory, sip.conf. And within that text file, you're going to define sections. We have our section header, square brackets. And here we've just thrown in generically account dash name. Right? That's just the name of the, the SIP account itself. Um, so in that section header is the account name. We have type equals friend. So uh, here's, another <laughs> here's another reason why uh, ChanSIP, uh, there's such a strong urge in certain circles for ChanSIP to go away is type equals friend versus type equals peer versus type equals user. So who, who has wrestled with that concept? What's the difference between type user, type friend, type peer? Hi, raise my hand. Okay. Um, I know it's after lunch. We're all like, ah, that's about as high as I'm going to get with that one. Uh, so type equals friend, type equals peer, type equals user. We're, we're going to look at that here in just a moment. Um, and I am, frankly, I'm kind of happy that I won't have to talk about that a whole lot going forward because it's kind of a tricky concept. I'll do my best to, to, to impart upon you uh, the, real, the real definition of that. So just know we're getting to it. Host equals dynamic. Host is the setting uh, where you could hard code an IP address, right? If I know this phone is always going to be 10, 10, 10, uh, 100, then I could say host equals that IP address, and forevermore, asterisk will expect uh, anything coming to, to it from that IP address to be this phone, okay? Yes? Is that the public IP address or the private IP address? Depends on if you're using some of those other uh, settings like extern IP or intern IP and which parts of NAT that you're using. So that's asterisk advanced. <laughs> um, but very, very good question. So who, who's using the NAT settings in ChanSIP? Sure, I'm thinking a lot of you probably. Maybe, you're, maybe you are and you're not, you're not aware of it. But um, yeah, network address translation is a thing. And the SIP protocol itself has an inherent, um, I don't want to say weakness, but uh, weakness about uh, dealing with NAT, right? Uh, we can get into that during one of the breaks if you really want to know a lot more about that. Um, but for, <laughs> what was that? Double. Yeah, double NAT. That's, ooh. Uh, um, especially when dealing with SIP. But uh, yeah, mo moving on from that, host equals dynamic. Uh, instead of hard coding an IP address, uh, this basically says the IP address for this device uh, will be dynamic, right? DHCP is a thing. Uh, and in that case, we're telling asterisk it's a dynamic IP address, so how can Asterisk know uh, where to send the call? If, if somebody calls into Asterisk and wants to ring this phone using this configuration, how will Asterisk know how to get the call to the phone? SIP registration. Exactly right. So that, that's exactly why SIP registration matters. Because instead of hard coding the IP address, you just say, hey, Asterisk, there is a, there's an endpoint, there's a device with uh, these configuration settings, but I'm not going to tell you the IP address just expect a registration from that, input, from that device. Okay? And once the registration comes in and the device has been registered, now Asterisk can send a call to it. Okay, so a really important concept about SIP registration there. Uh, next we have context equals inside. So context equals inside is exactly how we define what part of the dial plan, the endpoint, I'm just going to keep touching this phone, we're just pretending for a moment this is the account, account name device, right? Uh, which part of the dial plan this phone can dial. So if there is a, an extension somewhere in my dial plan that's uh, 500 at demo, and, uh, but there's no 500 defined on the uh, inside of the inside context, if I try to dial 500, I'm going to uh, get a call failure. There's, there's no 500 at inside. There's only 500 at demo or 500 at something else, or maybe it's not defined anywhere at all. So, so long as the inside context contains the extension that I'm dialing from that endpoint, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a successful call. Clear as mud? <laughs> is, it clear, is it crystal clear for any of you? Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at a few examples here. I wanna, I'm going to have to dig into a few other things. Last bit here, the secret equals, you know, and by the way, this slide is, uh, this slide's been around, so don't use that password. <laughs> it's, it looks secure, but just take home the, the feeling that it gives you of being random characters, okay? So that's the password that the device uh, should use to authenticate when it registers to asterisk. Okay, so 
I've already dug into a few of these already. Uh, we have account name, which is the username that they will use for their credentials. We have type. I'm going to dig into this in just a moment. Host equals dynamic. The endpoint would register as opposed to a hard-coded IP address. We've already talked about context and the account password. So now, friend, user, and peer. Um, friend, kind of, is a user and a peer. Okay, well, what are those? Uh, well, a user, uh, type equals user, is for inbound calls, and peer is for outbound calls, sort of. <laughs> you, see, you see why I'm so glad to be getting away? It's very difficult to just succinctly, unambiguously say this is definitely the situation. Um, but just understand that type equals friend very often is used for endpoints, and then type equals peer is very often used for trunks. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it. I'm not saying that's the best way to do it. I'm just saying that's what hap tends to happen um, for any myriad of reasons. There are plenty of people are setting up phones uh, where you'll set up the account twice. You'll say uh, type equals peer for this device and then type equals user for this device. So you have in and out. Uh, same thing for SIP trunks. That certainly happens. Um, where instead of just a peer, you have a peer and a user for the SIP trunk for whatever kind of situation is, is uh, you know, whatever kind of situation you're in. So this next slide has a bit, of def a bit more definition. Users are inbound only, no outbound. So inbound and outbound, just to, just to clarify, and my next slide gives you some graphics if, it, if that's what you're hanging on for. It's inbound and outbound from the perspective of asterisk. So most of the time when I, when I use the term inbound or outbound, I'm, I'm talking from the point of view of asterisk, okay? So if it's inbound to asterisk, it's a, it's a call from the device to asterisk. If it's outbound, it's outbound from asterisk to some other thing, okay? So inbound only means type equals user is only able to send a call into asterisk. In other words, asterisk does not know the IP address of a user, of a user account. Peers are inbound and outbound, so it can be outbound because asterisk knows the IP address. And uh, because asterisk knows the IP address of a peer, the call can go out to that endpoint, right? Asterisk knows how to reach it. And if a call comes in from that endpoint, asterisk will look at the IP address in the from header and say, okay, I know who you are because I have some peer defined that has host equals your IP address, right? That's, that's the big difference between the two. And um, I see a few of you going a bit like this. Yes, I, I feel... I feel the same way <laughs> because you know, for a very long time, type equals user, type equals peer has been very difficult to really convey. And of course, you're going to run home and immediately find some edge case where ah, that doesn't quite act this way, um, which is, again, another reason why PJ SIP became a thing. Friends are defined as, uh, will define both a user and a peer internally to asterisk. And they're also inbound and outbound. Even more confusing, the fact that friends and peers can both do inbound and outbound. The big difference is a friend is going to match on the username, right? So the username section of the from header in SIP. So who's dealt with SIP messages and you understand what I'm, I mean when I say a, a SIP header? Okay. All right, good. So it's a, a, a good number of you. Okay. Now, this sort of delves in a little bit, a little bit deeper um, into what the inbound and outbound means. So type equals user, inbound to asterisk, matches on username, type equals friend, inbound or outbound, um, and the username invite in the from header. Meanwhile, the peer is just matches on IP address. But if asterisk has the IP address to match on inbound, then you can, and I've done it, you, you can send a call to that peer because it already has the IP address. Send a call to it. So that's a very short version of SIP.conf. Uh, now we're going to look at PJSIP.conf. Uh, up first is the transport section. So as I mentioned earlier, these concepts are the same, to, you know, regardless of which, uh, which channel device driver you're using. Um, in PJSIP, it's a, it's a lot more apparent because the transport section gets its own, well, the transport uh, definition gets its own section, right? PJSIP has a lot more sections in it than ChanSIP. ChanSIP has just the one section. You've got a username, you've got all the credentials and uh, codecs and everything that this endpoint is supposed to use, and there you go. You've configured your endpoint in that one section. In PJSIP, it's very, very different. Uh, each device can have a number of sections to, to define that one device. So, and the way that, you can, that you're able to tell 
uh, whether or not you're working with a transport section or an endpoint section or, or some other type of section, is the type declaration. Type equals transport. That's all you need to do to say, okay, all the settings in this section deal with transport. Okay? And this is the, um, the default get you started transport configuration, by the way. That's all you need. Uh, you can put this anywhere you want in the file. It doesn't have to go in the general section or, uh, or anything like that. Um, in almost every asterisk configuration file, there's a general section. Uh, in PJSIP, there can be a general section. So that's another one of those things. It's a bit weird, uh, a bit unfamiliar. Um, exactly what we're defining here, of course, is the transport section. We're going to say protocol UDP, and we're just going to bind to anything. Right? You could bind that to a specific IP address or even um, a, a, a CIDR notation, so a, a range, a, a subnet range of, of IP addresses if you wanted to. Um, but for the sake of just uh, brevity and sort of let's get the thing up and running and then we can come back and dial it in, you can bind it to listen to anything. Right, now we have three more sections to look at here. Uh, up at the top we have an endpoint. Oh, I thought I was on the trackpad, but I was not. So up at the top here we have the endpoint section. How do I know that's the endpoint section? says type endpoint. Wasn't that easy? Uh, in the endpoint section, I'm defining the characteristics of the device itself, the endpoint. See, in PJSIP, an endpoint is an endpoint is an endpoint is an endpoint. It can be a trunk or a phone or what. It's just something that uses SIP. That, that's it. Uh, so, and how you define it and how you use it in your dial plan, in your dial plan that really defines the definition, that really uh, spells out the definition of what that endpoint does or that uh, device does. So type equals endpoint, context equals phones. Uh, that's the part of the dial plan that this device will have access to when it dials an extension. And, oh, I'm missing a few boxes here. Okay, well, we'll go in the order that the animations are because I'm beholden to that. Um, so disallow all and then allow you law up here. So does this feel familiar? What's going on right here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in, in, uh, in the old style, in uh, sip.conf, you could in the general section define um, which codecs are available for use generally, and you could specify per endpoint as well, and that's all we're seeing here. Um, disallow all and then allow you law. So we're saying this endpoint, um, step one, can use no codecs. Step two, okay, you can use you law. And you would never want to flip those, by the way, because this is read from top to bottom, right? If you flip those, um, then you're basically saying, okay, you can use you law, except no, you can't use anything. So now you have no codecs available. Those calls are not going to work out too, too well for you. Um, next, we've defined a transport. Transport equals transport-udp. That's just the name of the other section we defined on the previous slide. See how that works? So this endpoint is going to define a few other sections to point at. Right? You can reuse those sections for other things. Uh, finally, we have auth. Auth equals 7001. And then AORs equals 7001. So who knows about address of record and SIP? Sorry? Um, it's not unlike that, right? So uh, address of record is something that we'll, we'll dive into once we, once we get down to that section. But just understand that you may, when you get to AORs, you may go, oh, this is nuts. I'm just going to stick with chance zip. But you want to come back later then. I mean, maybe just come back later, read up a little bit, experiment, set up a VM, and, and sort of uh, play with that a little bit to figure out what an AOR is. Um, address of record is what it stands for. What does that really mean? Well, essentially, you can have multiple devices attached to a single account on here. So now you can just dial that account and dial plan. It'll ring all of them. And the first one to answer gets the call. Okay? So that's, that's one way of dealing with a situation where someone has you know, a desk phone, right? but I've also got a soft phone client on my cell phone, and I've got a desktop uh, soft phone client somewhere else. Yeah, it's find me, follow me with, with, with less, maybe a little less pain. 
maybe your implementation requires that sort of a, a, a dial plan set up, you know. But yeah, that, that's exactly what address of record is, and that's been a part of the SIP RFC for quite a while, and, and it's now realized an asterisk with, with PJ SIP. Uh, so, there's, uh, there's AORs um, off. This just points to another section, right? So off equals 7001 points to another type off section that has that in the title. That's all that means, right? So I've got my endpoint. My endpoint's going to use this section for authentication and that section for address of record. See how that works? All right. So type equals AOR. Network location is the, is the definition here. This is a very, very reminiscent of the host equals dynamic or host equals IP address in, in SIP.conf, all right? So right here, I have a big or, and exactly what we're saying is, um, maybe not write both of these at the same time. Uh, you could say max contacts equals two, and then say, okay, contact equals this hard-coded IP address. That is a very bright projector. Uh, contact equals 7001 at this hard-coded IP address. That's where you're defining this is the IP address that device will use. So anything coming into asterisk from that IP address with that uh, username in the SIP header um, is, it should match against this account. If you just leave it at max contacts equals one, now you're expecting a registration. Carefully stepping over that so I don't wipe out. Yep, that's exactly the point. And within, within memory, asterisk will cache um, that IP information for those multiple devices. So, and dial plan will be a little bit different when you do that sort of thing. Um, there's a, another dial plan function, but we're not to functions yet. Uh, I saw this hand and then. So the way, well, well, when you say max contacts equals one, right there you're limiting the number of, of, of uh, simultaneously registered devices, right? So max contacts defines the number of devices that can register against this address. Okay. Yes. So that would get into a little more dial plan wizardry where you have to, you have to on the fly, control the, control the call to pull the channel back from one device and send it to the other. Um, and there's a ton of different ways to get that done. I've seen somewhere, like, this is one of the reasons ConfBridge is a bit popular because people kind of hack together this thing. We're like, yeah, I'll just join a conference with myself and my other device and then hang up the other device and this sort of thing. Sometimes that can work, sometimes not, um, but not impossible is the short version. <laughs> uh, very cool. Oh, question. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can I just take, can I just take this section, uh, th this content here, and just lump it into the endpoint section? And the answer is no, because there are different modules. There are several different modules that um, constitute the PJ SIP channel driver, and there's a module that deals with authentication, with inbound authentication, as opposed to outbound authentication, right? So uh, if you want asterisk to register against a trunk, you have to use outbound authentication, that's a different configuration uh, module, so it's a different, conf uh, a different section in your config as well. So, uh, but very good question. I thought you were going to ask about uh, templates in the config files, and that's something I'll, I'll maybe drop in a little bit later as well. Um, so, good question there. Let's see, about auth. Auth type equals user pass. Who's using MD5 for SIP authentication? All right, good on you. Uh, those of you that are not, shame. <laughs> I mean, it depends, okay, if it's just like a little virtual machine on your laptop for, for, for play, okay, not a big deal. Um, but hey, it, it's there and it's not difficult to pull off to set up MD5, uh, MD5 authentication. And essentially all that means is instead of a plain text password username in the config file, you get an MD5 hash of uh, the username, the realm, and the password itself. And that's what you'll, that's what you'll pass back and forth between the device and asterisk. Um, Lots of good stuff on the wiki about that. Now, yeah, where to start in the dial plan? I apologize. I don't know why these animations decided to rearrange themselves. I'm going to totally blame 
the, the system. It's probably my fault, but really, it's the system. Um, so yeah, declare uh, allowed codex, disallow all, allow you law. I think we've already covered that, so everybody's happy there. All right, step one, we made it. Just a few more to go. Uh, we need to create an extension to dial that endpoint. So in the inside context, within extensions.conf, new config file, we were in pjsip.conf, now we're in extensions.conf. Uh, within the inside context, I have extend 7001, priority one, dial, and instead of sip slash whatever, it's just pjsip, forward slash, name of the address of record, comma 20. Uh, who knows what that comma 20 is? Hey. Is right, yeah, time. Okay, I, I owe so many stickers. I'll just trust you to come up to me and say, hey, I got a ride. Give me a sticker. Um, until I run out of stickers. Ah, very good question. So the question was, I'm, I'm using the term um, section header and context. Right, so instead of, okay, I'm using section header instead of context. So just to clarify, in any asterisk configuration file, if uh, you can generically refer to section headers. In extensions.conf, this is a context, all right? In uh, voicemail.conf, it would be a voicemail context, right? So the section header that you define there is a voicemail context. In sip.conf, it's an account. Right, so what goes in the section header in sip.conf? The account information, so the sip account name. All right, um, and here it's just another context. Is that, okay. So that's not a default Correct. So, uh, right in the in the sample config file, yeah. right. So in the sample con. Uh, uh, the question was, does this replace the default context? And the answer is no, there is a default context that's, as, that's built into part of the code, but generally speaking, whatever you want to write into your dial plan is what your context will be. You can name them anything you want. Um, and the point being, you can name the context something that's meaningful and useful to you, so it's easy to document, easy to explain it to the new people and this sort of thing. So this context is probably extensions inside the building, I'm just sort of guessing here, and you can make a good guess at that, at that too. All right, uh, so yeah, the above extension means this endpoint will access the inside context and can dial that endpoint you've configured in sip.conf at 7001. So a little bit of a mistake there. Make a mental note, not sip.conf, pjsip.conf. Because again, different channel driver. So I missed one whole slide, my mistake. So. We've, we've, worked on, we've worked on two different config files here, right? We've worked on pjsip and extensions.conf. So let's look at how a call flows in and out of asterisk from the perspective of the config files themselves. First we have uh, Doug. Doug has an endpoint and Jane also has an endpoint. Now end users will send an email and say, hey, extension 200 is, is um, on fire or whatever they, whatever they say in their trouble ticket, right? But we really know now that extension 200 is just something that's been defined over there in extensions.conf. Jane's talking about her phone that's on fire, so you know, water. Um, Doug dials 200, and that SIP message goes into, uh, go, well, that, that channel is set up with asterisk, and the phone sends the information to asterisk and says, hey, uh, I'm this endpoint, and I need to dial the extension 200. So inside of pjsip.conf, that endpoint will be checked and we see context equals inside. Does that make sense? Doug's phone has access to the inside context. So now we go, we shuffle our way over to extensions.conf and within the inside context, we find one of the extensions is defined as 200. And that 200 uh, extension executes the dial application using the pjsip channel driver against the uh, Jane endpoint. So, Oh, oh, one more mistake. Can anybody see the mistake here? All right, elect a leader and have them say it really loud once. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly right. 
So, um, yes, although, yeah, yeah, they would have had to have dialed this, exactly. So, um, and, and this is one of those sort of uh, funny things between PJSIP and SIP.conf. In uh, SIP.conf, the recommendation has been, uh, for security purposes really, uh, you know, don't use an extension number to register an endpoint. Has, has anybody heard this before? Don't, don't use the extension number as the credential, right? Use some difficult to use device name. Um, but, and this appe it appears as if we're turning our back on this sort of a thing, but that's not the case actually. The authentication section uh, will allow you to use a, a, a true blue username like Jane's phone or Bob's endpoint or whatever you want to call it for registration. But you have the added benefit in your dial plan of using a real extension number right here, right now, let me make this right. All right, something's happening, there we go. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we have PJSIP 200. Uh, that real true blue extension number makes life a lot easier in the dial plan. We'll, we'll see about why that is when we get into dial plan variables. Uh, specifically the extend variable, uh, probably my favorite variable. So dialing PJSIP 200 goes back into PJSIP and says, hey, I need an address of record named 200. What do you have? And of course, asterisk is uh, has, having already loaded this file into memory, sees, yes, here's, here's an address of record named 200, and here's how to reach that device on the network. So that's how the call gets into asterisk and then back out of asterisk to the other device. And at this point, the, the phone will begin to ring. Okay. Any questions about what happened on this slide? So if I have max contacts equals one right there for the AOR, Jane's phone will need to register before this would work. And once Jane's phone registers, this config file will continue to say max context equals one. It doesn't actually touch the config file itself. But in memory, asterisk will cache that information. So while asterisk is up, asterisk knows Jane's endpoint is so-and-so IP address because I got a registration from there. All right. Very good question. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, now we want to configure the endpoint. Asterisk is looking pretty good. We've got accounts set up. We've got uh, an extension, a little bit of dial plan, very little. And now we want to configure the endpoint itself. There's a couple of ways to configure endpoints. Um, show of hands, who has had to use the actual device itself, like hit the menu button on the device and navigate through and configure the endpoint? All right, a lot of you. Yeah. And, and have you done that more than twice? Oh, geez, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you've done it exactly twice, that's the right number. You're like, oh, this is crazy, what am I doing? Um, again, if you're just trying to like, set something up really quick on a lab and you, you don't have a, something on the network with a browser so that you can get to the device's uh, you know, web interface, because an awful lot of SIP phones provide just that. Digium phones and, a lot, and pretty much every phone that's worth its weight uh, in SALT is gonna have, provide that ability. And you know, what I mean there is you're, you're gonna open up a web browser to the IP address of the phone and you can configure it right there makes life a lot easier. But again, it's manual, it doesn't scale very well. You still gotta actually touch each individual phone physically, get the IP address, log in, put all the crap in. Oh, I misspelled something on the 52nd one, so let me go back. I've only got 2,000 left, right? This is not the way to do, it's not the way to live. So uh, a while ago, quite a while ago, uh, something was developed in, as part of the SIP RFC uh, using DHCP option 66. You can automatically provision uh, a lot of phones in fact, all of your phones if you want, um, using a DHCP server and option 66 provided by that uh, DHCP server to your network. So who, who's using option 66 with DHCP? Yeah, made life a lot easier, didn't it? Was it painful to, at first, was it painful to just sort out those XML files, make sure that they were exactly perfectly correctly formatted? A little bit, but once you got it going, it was fine, right? So a few, a few late nights crying you know, uh, tears on your pillow sort of thing with, with XML files, but then you got it going, everything's fine, right? So provisioning is definitely the way to go. Well, with, with Digium phones, uh, Digium decided, 
since we have, uh, since we're building all this really cool stuff that's going to make the Digium phones work really well with Asterisk, why don't we try to provide an even better answer to this provisioning problem? And out of that came DPMA. DPMA is the Digium phone module for Asterisk. And essentially what it does is uh, once you plug a phone into a network where an Asterisk server is up and running and is, is also running uh, DPMA, uh, it will detect, they will detect each other and the phone will load up a little list of uh, extensions that are available and the end user can just select their name from the list and hit go and it will pull down their configuration to that phone. Um, all of that's controlled not with XML files but with configuration files in asterisk. All right, so I'm gonna see if I can see some, well you know what, here. Let's look at this slide just really quick. This will be the last slide we look at before I attempt something. Um, so this other file, resdigiumphone.conf. This is the configuration file for DPMA. All right, now, just, to, just as a sanity check of where we are right now, we've already configured the account in pjsip.conf. We've configured the dial plan so that the endpoint can be rung. Now, we have a couple of options to configure the device itself. We can walk around to every device and you know, manually touch every device and put the credentials in there and tell it the IP address and so forth. We can log into the web GUI uh, for each device. We can use uh, option 66 to push a bunch of XML config files to the, to the phone, um, or we can use DPMA. So just a sanity check of where we are. We're configuring the device itself, not necessarily the SIP account, okay? Uh, that being said, because both parts are, part of a are, are within asterisk, you can reuse some things. And that's why there's a big arrow running from uh, resdigiumphone.conf all the way over to pjsip.conf for that AOR section. You see, in this type equals line section that's part of resdigiumphone.conf, I'm defining a line for the device to use, but I'm not actually passing in any you know, credentials or uh, IP address information or anything like that. Right? I, don't, I don't have to do that in DPMA. I've already done it over in pjsip.com, so why would I want to type that out again? In other words, uh, it's reusing the configuration between the two. So that line section corresponds to an address of record that's already been set up in, in um, pjsip.com. All right? So, and I'll, I'll pull up, I'm about to pull up some examples of this. I need to move a phone to a table here just, just briefly. So, before we get to interactive dial plan, first I want to look at this guy. Okay. So what you're looking at is actually, yeah, could I employ one of you gentlemen to, to press a few buttons for me? Sure. My arms aren't quite that long. Um, so what you're looking at is a, a screen cap of that D70 that's on my little, connected to my little switch down here uh, right next to an open bottle of water. So don't startle me and I'm going to bump that with my knee. We're all done. Um, but this is what you see on that phone right now, yes? Okay, if you could, and now what I gotta do is just ride the, re the, <laughs> the reload button here. Um, if you could, press the filter soft key. All right, so that's what you're seeing now? Okay, and if you could, scroll down to all extensions. All right, and select that. Okay. So you've got a couple of options here. Now, again, this is the sort of thing where you, you write an email, you take a screenshot, you write an email to all your end users and say, okay, press this, press this, put your pin code in, your phone's provisioned, have a nice day. Right? That, that's, that's what the DPMA is really for. It's trying to get administrators home on time for dinner. Okay? So I already have uh, one of those endpoints configured for this phone up here, so if you could select uh, phone of the boss. Okay, and maybe this will work. Now, while that's cooking, I'm going to come back over here. This is my asterisk CLI. And I haven't tested this in a couple of days, so because the air may have moved, I can't definitely say if it's going to work. But right now, the phone is pulling down or attempting to pull down uh, 
the configuration from my virtual machine, my asterisk uh, virtual machine running uh, in the, in my, uh, on my Mac right now. Is that what you're still seeing? Okay. Oh, I think my network's unhappy. I've left it on, I've left it unconfigured for too long. So here's one command line um, uh, tool, pjsip show. And from pjsip show, you can get a list of, uh, not just a list of, but a lot of information about several different objects that have been configured within pjsip. Um, pjsip show endpoints gives me a list of, well, the two endpoints that I've currently configured. Uh, one of them is 7001, there's the endpoint name. And then 7002, there's the other endpoint name. Now, for authentication purposes, I've actually used a different name. I haven't used 7001. This way, those automated scripts that are constantly trying to get a registration on your system so they can do bad things, um, they, it's going to be much difficult to guess some name like Alice's phone or Spider phone or whatever it might be as opposed to 7001. And of course, the AOR, the address of record, uh, being 7001 as well. Now, the contact. This is what Astros needs to know in order to get a call to the device. That's why it has the full SIP name, um, SIP colon 7001 at IP address. And the uh, same thing for this other phone, of course, right now it doesn't have a contact because it's not registered, because again, ah, okay. So yeah, I get to troubleshoot a, vir a virtual machine during the break, yay. Uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, in any case, the, the point being, we have, well, you know, let me pop out of there and... So we have our endpoints, and this is just a section that I just threw in at the top to kind of let myself know what's going on. Here's my endpoint, uh, here, here are all of my endpoints, and I have an AOR and an authentication, and we can see the username and password is not 7001, and some password, it's actual username and password. So this way you can avoid, you can still avoid that, that uh, difficult issue of, you know, opening up accounts that are kind of easy to guess for those scripts to just you know, knock, knock over your server. Uh, and finally, the endpoint itself. Let's see, transport AORs, I believe there was a, oh yeah, caller ID. <clears throat> One, uh, well, actually two things here. Caller ID, I think we know what that is, right? I'm defining the caller ID for that device. When, that, when this device makes a call, the caller ID will be set to caller ID. Did the, oh, did something happen on that thing or? Okay. Oh, your cell phone, Never mind. Uh, <laughs> so there's caller ID. Uh, the other option here, direct media. Who knows about direct media? A little bit? Who, who wants to offer a? Yes, exactly right. So there's, there's SIP, right? SIP is the control protocol that sets up and tears down, controls the actual session itself. But there's another protocol involved, there's several actually, um, but the other really big one is RTP, real-time protocol. And RTP is what carries the payload, carries the, the voice, all right? So you can have asterisk controlling uh, two different devices. It can control everything about that call um, using just the SIP signaling, but the RTP can go directly between the two devices. Okay, um, and by this is actually a, a default uh, feature of SIP itself. You can turn that off with direct underscore media equals no in PJ SIP. Um, does anybody know what it, that is in SIP.conf? Yeah, it's just direct media with no underscore. So just direct media equals no. Um, all right, so. So this uh, can reinvite, right? That used to be the, the name of it. Um, uh, that used to be the parameter you could use in, in asterisk 1.8 and earlier. And I want to say that even though it's not documented, I think it's respected in 11. I haven't actually tried it in 13. Um, okay, yeah. So you, you can use uh, can reinvite um, or direct media. They, they updated the name to direct media, but um, they both work there. All right. So there's pjsip.conf for the two endpoints. Uh, let me also look at resdigiumphone.conf. Now here I have employed, and, and you'll see 
uh, I've employed the pound include uh, trick so that I can take content from some other file and include it into this configuration when it's loaded. Right now what you're looking at is the default sample config file for uh, Resdigium phone. So this is going to give you a lot of really great uh, information if you need to go do a bit of research to figure out, hey, how can I accomplish um, you know, some other configuration that's not quite presenting itself in the command line. And it's quite a long file. Now, at the very bottom, maybe you can see this, maybe you can't, it says uh, pound include res underscore dpma underscore astrocon.conf. So this whole file is just empty based from the perspective of asterisk. It's empty except for the general section at the very top and this pound include statement. And the reason I did that was one to illustrate the pound include, the file include uh, syntax. But two, um, I want to, my hands want to type DPMA instead of Digium phones. This is just my habit. I'm not saying you have to name it this. You could name it unicorns.blah. It doesn't matter. It's just a text file, okay? So long as the text file name matches in both, the name of the file matches what you've written in that config file, asterisk is going to load it. So I'm gonna have a look at res DPMA. So here we have the corresponding um, DPMA configuration between uh, the two PJSIP config files, we, or configuration endpoints we saw a moment ago. I'll open up the other one really quick side by side so we can. All right, so on the uh, left hand side we have pjsip.conf. And you can see here the AOR for 7001 matches my line for spider phone. All right. Is anybody unclear about what's happening here? On the right hand side, we're defining a SIP account. On the left hand side, we're defining a device, a Digium phone specifically. And we're doing that all from the server instead of having to walk around and touch every phone. Sorry? Uh, oh, yes, the endpoint's on the right. Thank you very much. I was, uh, I was trying to do the stage left, stage right, but it completely failed, my bad. Um, yeah, the device itself is defined on the right, the SIP account on the left. That's where the address of record content is. So, sorry, anybody recording that, just kind of back up and overwrite that last bit of footage. All right, so now, yeah, since that timed out, I will move on to interactive dial plan. And I believe this session, this session goes to three and then there's a break, is that the case? Okay, just wanna make sure that I'm, I'm in the right place. So, interactive dial plan, um, we're gonna talk about more applications. We're going to look at uh, how to build a voice menu. And by voice menu, I just mean some uh, you know, sound prompts that are presented to a caller, okay? If, if, if someone calls into your business, uh, you want them to hear uh, you know, a very polite, helpful person say, please press one for sales or two for this or three for that. Um, th this is exactly what I'm talking about. And we'll touch on the difference between an IVR and an auto attendant. Uh, who, who here sees a difference between IVR and auto attendant? Okay, so wh wh what's the difference between IVR and auto attendant? Okay, ah, so, I, and I think I may, I may have heard you say audio attendant? Okay, okay, so, yes, th this is one of the definitions that uh, people use, and I, I am always glad to just say, yep, because pe certain people have different definitions. Some people say they're really the same thing. Uh, other people say, no, they're, they're very, very different. So his response was, um, an IVR is going to consume DTMF input from the caller to route their call whereas auto attendant is going to use uh, speech recognition. Um, this can be the case in your dial plan if you have a speech recognition engine uh, set up and attached uh, to use asterisk as well. Uh, so yeah, just a, just a quick touch on that. And then set up voicemail if we have time. If we don't, that can wait till after the break, no big deal. So IVR basics, um, take DTMF input from the caller or voice input from the caller, and uh, the IVR is going to return a result, often connecting to an external database to retrieve that information for the caller. This is just one more definition that I have heard 
uh, fairly frequently to say, uh, to define what an IVR is. It's going to take input from the call, it's going to be controlled by the caller's actions, and then it's going to reach out to some other system, probably a database, to get some information that's unique to that caller, right? So think calling your bank to check your, your balance using, without talking to a human. You're just typing in things on the DTMF pad and it, re it plays back a, an account balance or something like this, right? Um, that's one definition of IVR. And then auto attendant just plays a message and then moves you around in the dial plan. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to at all get into a fight and argue like this is definitely the definition. Uh, and if you don't believe it this way, then you're totally wrong. This is just the, uh, you know, the definition that I've uh, seen fairly frequently, but I'm, I'm glad to be flexible on that. Uh, here's a bit of dial plan very little dial plan that it actually is a full-on um, IVR. So it offers us several things. We'll look at each one of these as we go along. Who, has, uh, who is familiar with the special extensions in Asterisk? Okay, special extensions. So uh, what special extension do you see on this board? Give me one of them. I? Yeah, T? All right. Yeah, I? S, all right. I think that's, yeah, that's all of them there. So I, T, and, and S, these are the extensions, right? The S extension, the I or the T extension. Remember, we can name an extension anything we want. There are some, a, a class of special extensions that are triggered when a certain uh, uh, parameter is met, right? So uh, in the example of S, Whenever a call comes into asterisk that has no did information provided, right? Um, asterisk has to start somewhere, so it's going to start with the S extension in that context. And just, just to clarify, what in the world does that mean to have no did information? I mean, you send a call to asterisk, how can it not have an extension? Well, um, if you think about uh, old school landlines, and actually this is a good poll question too, how many of you have like POTS lines to your home? Okay, almost, had, okay, four or five, all right. I thought, I thought for once I, I was gonna have a full room of, now, and when I say, you know, a POTS line, I don't mean like a POTS line back to your cable modem that, you know, hits coax and then it's data from there on out. I mean a full on off the, you know, hanging off the power pole a telephone line. Okay, so uh, more, and, we're getting closer and closer to that round number of zero. No, nobody raises their hand when I ask that. We're getting closer and closer. Um, so uh, POTS, a POTS line, an analog telephone line, when, a, when a, a call goes to your analog phone, it's not going to have an extension or a did or anything attached to that call, right? It's just ringing that endpoint. It just calls your phone, right? So if you send a call into asterisk by way of a POTS line, for example, when it gets into asterisk, it's, it's acting very much the same way. That call is expecting to just ring some phone. It's not going to say, hey, analog phone, connect me to uh, the sales department. No, the analog phone is just going to ring because that's all an analog phone is going to do, right? So the S, for that kind of a scenario, the S extension is very handy because asterisk doesn't really know what to do with a call that comes in that doesn't have any DID, uh, DID information. That's, where, that's the special scenario where the S extension will be triggered. And in this case, the answer application is uh, executed. Uh, the answer application, just briefly, is going to go ahead and set up uh, the call for use. So set up uh, media on the call so that the other end knows that you're handling the call, you've taken control of the call, you're ready to begin receiving and transmitting media. All right. The reason we have the answer application in, in any case is there are certain other uh, applications within Asterisk that will not set up media. Right Now, this is a bit of a poor example because background actually will set up the media for you. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I gotta make sure I've got answer in there before background, otherwise things won't work out. Um, just, as a, just as an illustration of what answer does. So how about background? Who knows what background does? Someone, someone new? Um, yeah, plays a sound file just like playback, right? Except for one little difference. Yeah. It takes input, it takes DTMF input as well. So background, in this example, background will play main menu and it will also allow the user to enter DTMF to route to some other part of the dial plan. All right, so in this case, while I'm listening to main menu, I could press two 
and I, and I would immediately be sent to the to extension, which executes the queue application. We'll get into what that is here in just a moment. Next, we have wait extend. Of course, there's wait, right? The wait application, if you've never seen that before, it just pauses the, app, it pauses the dial plan at that point. So if you call in, you hit wait for 30 seconds, you're just going to sit there for 30 seconds until something else happens. Um, well, until the next application executes. Uh, wait extend does the same sort of thing, except it will, it, it will uh, allow you to dial DTMF. And it, same as background, it'll route you to whatever extension you've dialed. And then finally, hang up. Anybody unfamiliar with hang up? I think we're all comfortable there. Okay. It hangs up, just, just so you know. And also, if you ever have a question about that, by the way, you can go to the Astro CLI and type core show application and then name of that specific application. We saw an example earlier of core show applications, plural, you know, list of all of them. But core show application dial or core show application hang up uh, will give you a, essentially the help file for that module, or for that application rather. So we have uh, queue sales and then queue support, and that's extension one and extension two. What do you think the queue application might do? Yeah, put, put the caller into a, a queue, yeah, a holding area, and they'll, just, they'll, they'll hear music on hold and wait for some very helpful person to answer once they're available, right? That's all a queue does. So in order to join a queue as a caller, this is the dial plan application you'll, you'll execute. There are other dial plan applications uh, that your um, employees will use to log into or log out of a queue as well. And it'll be a different application. It won't be this one. Um, so there's a queue named sales and a queue named support, and certain endpoints are a member of one or both of those queues. It's just as simple as that to set up queues, uh, call queues and asterisk. Then we have directory. Who's using directory? So only if you're just the people that are awake? All right. So the directory application uh, will provide a dial by name directory for all the endpoints that are set up in your, in your system. I shouldn't say all the endpoints are set up in your system because uh, well, first off, how does it even know the first and last name of the users, right? In order to, to get that, you've got to tell Asterisk at some point everyone's first and last name so that when someone calls in and they dial three and then uh, Allison says, you know, please enter the first three letters of the person's last name you, would, you wish to reach. Right? In order for that to work, Asterisk has to know the first three letters of everybody's last name, right? So how do you get that? Well, when you set up voicemail, when you set up voicemail, we're looking at that next, you actually define a first and last name in voicemail.conf. So the directory application just reuses that, that information. And now, you, anybody who has a voicemail box set up this way uh, will be a part of the dial by name directory. Uh, next we have dial. So everybody's familiar with press zero, right? Press zero because I'm tired of this. And we're going to dial probably the operator. Oh, yes? Is there a way of giving a list of the users and their extensions to play that back for a caller? Uh, to play back a list of all every user? Yeah. Hmm. So dial by name directory is, is going to give you the option to listen to any of them. But to listen to all of them, you could probably um, just hit there may be an option in directory. I don't know if there is one that, for that because that seems like a, a peculiar use case, right? Um, you could set that up in dial plan, though. You could set up some dial plan to just, uh, you know, play back sound files for all the extensions that are available. Although, yeah, yeah, that's the sort of thing I'm imagining. But what's the use case there? Yeah. How many how many users are we talking, or how many extensions are we talking about? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that would be a bit hard-coded, though. You'd probably want some logic to automatically expand as, as more extensions are added. Um, but not impossible. I don't know off the top of my head of an option that, that would do that just out of the box because it seems like the sort of thing, you know, if you've got 255 <laughs> endpoints, like, can I get a list of all 255? Um, yeah, that would be something interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's something that I would, the first place I would look for that is going to be dial plan. Um, okay, so dial the operator when you're, you're sick and tired of this menu. Now we have the other two special extensions, I and T. 
And as special extensions go, uh, these are used fairly, fairly commonly to hand, uh, help people sort of figure out what's going on, right? If, uh, if you listen to the main menu and you go, I don't know, they didn't say anything about an option five, but I really want to press option five. Let me just see, ah, what's the worst that could happen? I'm just going to hit option five. Let me see what happens. And if, with, this, that, with this setup, if you just hit option five, it's going to route you to the I extension because I stands for invalid. So if you dial an extension that is not defined in this context, Asterisk will route you to that uh, I extension. And then whatever you define for that invalid extension is what will happen. You could have that ring the operator immediately, like, hey, they don't know what they're doing. Call the operator so that they can help you. Here we're just playing back invalid and then using go to to go to S extension comma menu beginning. What is that? What's that go to doing here? Yeah, it's jumping to a label in the S extension. Exactly right. So it's just going to go to extension, uh, S extension at the menu beginning priority label. Um, and same thing with the T uh, extension. This, the T special extension is for timeout. So if you take too long, right, you can hit a digit timeout, and that will route you to the lowercase t special extension. And so, you know, if you listen to menu, uh, if you listen to the menu and then you have the wait extent of five seconds and uh, you actually hit the digit timeout before getting to that hang up, although this specific example, um, and, and let me just make something clear. All these slides are for, you know, educational purposes only, right? This is not production ready. Um, if you put this sort of thing into your menu, you may encounter some uh, unfriendly uh, behavior, right? So there's a digit timeout that may get into an argument with the wait extend timeout, all right? Either way, you might hit that hang up or you might hit the T uh, extension, okay? So make sure you're handling these things gratefully. So the question was, is there a limit to the number of options that um, a caller could have in the menu, in a phone menu? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Because again, an extension is whatever you define it to be. So I could have um, Q sales and Q support. I could make those uh, 100 and 200 and 300 if I wanted to. Right? It's just going to make my caller have to dial more and they'll be like, well, this is a crazy menu. Dial 100 for sales? What are you talking about? Um, I just want to press one. So there's, there's no limit to that. However, I would say, and I, I saw your hand, um, but, but I will say that usually you have extensions, like your business is going to have extensions is somewhere in like the 6,000 6, or 7,000 range, right, or, or higher. Um, sometimes you'll see people using the 1,000 range. So like all our extensions in this building are 1,000, all the extensions in this other building are 2,000, right, so 2,001 and so forth. Uh, the reason you don't want to do that is because of this right here. I've included phones. Now this is not a file include, this is a context include. And basically what that means is if I dial uh, into this menu and I listen to the menu and part of that, me that main menu uh, sound file, because I'm, I'm going to record it myself, right? Um, it's going to say, if you know the party's extension, please dial it at any time. We're all familiar with that sort of thing. And exactly what's happening there is there's an include to the phone's context. So I could dial 1, 2, 3, or 0, or I could just go ahead and dial 6, 2, 3, 8 and get to Justin. Okay, and the reason that works is Asterisk looks through here and says, I don't see a 6238 in here. Let me look for an included context. And within that phone's context, oh, there's a 6238 extension. I'll, I'll do whatever that extension says. All right? You left that last line off, then you could have anything and it wouldn't conflict with this extension. Exactly. A one field should write a one. Mm hmm. If, if it is unambiguous, yes. Yeah, once you dial one here, it's going to match on that one and say, yep, it's right here. I don't need to look any further. I found, I found one. I found it. I don't have to look through this. Right? So if it's within the same context, then you start getting kind of a weird situation, which is why context includes are really handy this way too. Um, by the way, I just kind of slipped in a fairly complex idea. Um, context includes, but you didn't even notice, did you? It's actually pretty easy. If I'm in this context and I dial something that's not here, well, go look for it in some other context that I've included. That's all there is to it. Everybody know how context includes work? Did you know before I did that? Be honest. All right, okay. 
Um, but you know now? All right, great. I got one. Okay. Uh, so there's our menu so far. We have uh, alternate approaches. We've already mentioned uh, automatic speech recognition. Uh, LumenVox, Vestec, these are um, speech recognition engines that will couple up with Asterisk and feed the media stream from the caller through Asterisk to that speech recognition engine. The speech recognition engine does all of its magic and then it feeds back to Asterisk whatever you need it to feed back to it in order to make an intelligent decision about what to do next in that call. Uh, the point I'm making here is Asterisk does not ship with a speech recognition engine. Asterisk is primarily concerned with routing media. It's not really concerned with translating or trans, or, or no, well, it is concerned with transcoding, but translating uh, audio that humans speak into text. That's why we have uh, the need for a, an ASR engine that will connect to Asterisk. And these are two of the more popular ones. There's certainly uh, many of them out there. There's also uh, Kepstrel, uh, text-to-speech. So um, if you want to write out a script and then have Allison's voice read it um, in fairly decent uh, quality, I mean, after you compress it down to 8K, excuse me, um, then, uh, yeah, you can, you can accomplish that with Kepstrel. Now, these two things up here, something I want to address after the break because we're three minutes until the break, but there's read and go to if. And if you're here in my earlier sessions, you may have seen in my little example dial plan I was fiddling with the read application and the go to if application. Uh, I'm willing to bet many of you are using go to if. Who, who's, who's using go to if in your dial plan? Okay. All right. Yes. Good. Who's using go sub if? All right. Who's using macro? Okay. All right. We've got to have talk. Uh, so uh, there's go to if. How about the read application? All right. What's what's read application do for me? Yes. Yeah. It'll read the input for the, the the DTMF input from the caller and store that in a variable, and then you can reuse that variable to make a decision about routing. So this is just another way of building an, an IVR that will intelligently handle uh, what selection the caller makes in your menu. All right. Okay. So I'll go ahead and give you all a whole two-minute head start on the other sessions uh, for, the, uh, for the break. This is a good stopping point uh, before we get back into it, and then we'll finish up this and then hit Advanced Dial Plan in Session 4. All right.